Welcome to Vancouver Business Network, where entrepreneurs learn, network, and grow. I'm Roger Killen, the organizer. This talk is brought to you by Envision Coworking, where you'll share an inspiring space with a community of creative and supportive people. Our speaker is John Lombard. John spent 25 years in China uh, working as a cultural consultant to international organizations. He is a respected expert in the field of helping businesses understand and adapt to cultural differences. In 2019, John relocated to Vancouver where he operates a consulting business called the Language of Culture. Vancouver Business Network members and most welcome guests, let's put our hands together and give John Lombard a warm BBN welcome. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you everybody very much for coming out tonight. Um, I'm very confident what I'm going to show you tonight, uh, if you haven't or even if you have studied culture before, what I'm gonna be doing with you tonight is going to entirely change your understanding of culture and how you look at culture. Uh, culture has always been taught in much the same way that we teach language. I go to China, so I learn the Chinese language, the Chinese culture. I go to Germany, I learn the German language, the German culture. Learning Chinese language does not help me in Germany. Learning Chinese culture does not help me in Germany. They're taught separately. Now language, it's necessary to teach that way. But culture, we need to stop thinking of culture that way. Culture is not a bunch of different languages, a bunch of, culture is one language that has different dialects. And that's why I call my company the language of culture. It is one language. And if you understand the basic underlying language, then you will be able to actually understand any culture that you have to deal with. They're just different dialects. What we're gonna be focusing on tonight is how to identify and understand those dialects. Now, who is this useful for? To me, I think this is useful for pretty well everybody. Unless you're living in some tiny little isolated village somewhere where everybody is the same. Today, most of us are living in, in communities that are very, very multicultural. We're dealing with, we have friends from different cultures. We may have family members through marriage or adoption that are from different cultures. We have colleagues that are from different cultures, clients. Uh, we may, a lot of us want to travel and experience other cultures. All of these things, whatever your motivation is, tonight this will help you massively with being able to understand, respond to, and build relationships with people in those cultures. From a business perspective, I think this is particularly important because there are, massive cultural groups. You know, just in Vancouver, we've got you know, Chinese here, and we've got Indians here, and we have all these different groups, which a lot of people tend to be rather intimidated by. They see them as very, I, I've talked to a lot of people who say that, well, I'd like to do business with them, but they're very insular. They're very closed off. They're not interested in outsiders. They keep to themselves. That is not true. I have engaged with people in those communities. Uh, of course, China, I know the culture very well. I was there 25 years. But India, I, I've, I've engaged with many, many Indian business people here and had an amazing experience doing it. So this is something which can open up whole new markets, new opportunities uh, within your company if you have employees who are from different cultural backgrounds. This will help you to better understand those employees, have communication with them, uh, to be able to utilize perhaps those cultural differences. There's been tons of research which has been done which shows that cultural diversity has a massive beneficial impact on a company. Companies that are more culturally diverse have higher profits for the simple reason that they've got more ideas, more different perspectives, and able to effectively reach more markets. So I want to talk first of all about what is cultural diversity. 
a lot of people, particularly companies, when I talk about cultural diversity, they just think in terms of, oh, my company is culturally diverse. We have people from different cultures. Being culturally diverse is not the same as cultural diversity. In fact, being culturally diverse, having a lot of people from different cultures working together, living together, can be disastrous if those people don't understand the cultural differences, how to relate to each other, how to communicate, how to build relationships. When we're talking about cultural diversity, we're talking about not just having a lot of different cultures together, but having those people able to understand those differences, to have effective communication, to build effective relationships with each other, to not be isolated in these little pockets that all the people from one group are here, all the people from another group are here, but they're able to effectively intermix. So it's about having those different cultures effectively integrating, and it's about improving their ability to not only understand, but to adapt to their cultural differences. So like for me, when I'm, when I'm dealing with someone from another culture, I will actually adapt my behavior and my expectations. The way I will behave, the way I communicate, everything will change according to the, 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 the culture of the person that I'm dealing with. And most importantly, it's about eliminating cultural stereotypes and learning to see someone as an individual. And this is where what I do is different from what 98% 90, of the people who do cultural training are doing. Almost all cultural training is done using stereotypes. Chinese culture is like this. German culture is like this. Two problems with that. First of all, those stereotypes are very frequently inaccurate. Uh, we have people from China here tonight. If I take someone from Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and, and uh, Chongqing, there are massive cultural differences according to which region of China they're from. If I take a 25-year-old, 45-year-old, and 65-year-old Chinese, they have grown up in completely different countries, even though they've all been in China. China has changed so quickly. They are completely different from each other. Look at Canada. We talk about Canadian culture. Take a person from Vancouver, from Calgary, from Montreal, and from Halifax. We've got huge differences. So these stereotypes are, first of all, very, very inaccurate. And second of all, <clears throat> these stereotypes, when you teach about culture using stereotypes, it automatically gives the idea that they, it's kind of us and them. They are different. They're exotic, they're weird, they're strange, whatever it is, but they are not like us. When we look at the diversity industry, gender diversity is about getting rid of stereotypes about gender roles. LGBTQ diversity is about getting rid of stereotypes about the LGBTQ community. Uh, racial diversity is about getting rid of stereotypes about different races. But culture, almost all culture, is still being taught using stereotypes. And this is what I did in China for 25 years. Well, 20 years. Was teaching culture using stereotypes. This is Western culture. This is Chinese culture. This is how foreigners can work in China. This is how Chinese can work overseas but I became more and more frustrated with that and started looking at, is there another way that we can look at culture and understand culture? And the answer is yes, there is. And that's what we're gonna be doing tonight. So cultural diversity, a big part of cultural diversity is cultural intelligence. And think of cultural intelligence much the same way that we do emotional intelligence. Okay, if you look back at the 80s and 90s, Companies are spending massive amounts of money on leadership training, communication training, team building, things like this. And the results were extremely unpredictable and very, very poor. Why? Well, then along came emotional intelligence and people started realizing if you have someone who has low emotional intelligence, low EQ, 
doesn't matter how much you teach them about leadership or communication or these things, they're not going to learn effectively because they have a low EQ. They're unable to control their own emotions. They're unable to recognize other people's emotional reactions and respond appropriately. So by first focusing on EQ, helping people improve their emotional intelligence, then doing those other types of training, that made everything much more effective. Cultural intelligence is much the same. Cultural intelligence is the foundation. If you have low cultural intelligence, just like in China, I saw so many people coming over there and you had, you had the foreigners who come over that doesn't matter how long they're there, they never learn the language, don't like the food, don't have any local friends, they just hang out with the expat community. Those people have low cultural intelligence. Doesn't matter how long they're there, they don't, even, they don't have the desire or the ability to learn or adapt to the culture. You had people that were able to adapt somewhat, but were never really comfortable there. They had kind of medium level cultural intelligence. Then you had the people that went there and thrived, learned the language, learned the culture, had many local friends, and loved being there. Those are people who had high cultural intelligence. Now the good news is, just like emotional intelligence, cultural intelligence can be improved. So that's a large part of what I focus on is building your cultural intelligence because if you have a higher cultural intelligence, then you're exposed to a particular culture, learn about a particular culture, you're going to be able to learn about it much more quickly, much more effectively, adapt much more easily. If your cultural intelligence is low, you've you're gonna have a much, much harder time. It's gonna be a much bigger struggle. So cultural intelligence is a measure of a person's ability to learn about, understand, and adapt to different cultures. And this is a distinct field of study. This isn't some theoretical thing. There's actually researchers that took thousands of people that were living in different cultures, looked at how effectively had they adapted to that culture, and then identified the common characteristics. What were the common characteristics for the people that didn't adapt? What were the common characteristics for the people that did adapt? So this is, this is something that there is concrete, solid data that we know what traits can improve your cultural intelligence. We know what to focus on to, to train you and make you better. And it provides a universal foundation to build understanding of specific cultures. And this is very important. Uh, if traditional cultural training, I have to do a separate training for every culture. I would have to do one training about Chinese culture, another training about Indian culture, things like that. This training is universal. I could do this with 50 different cultures in the room and it would be equally applicable, equally useful for every person there. It is a universal platform that works for everyone. Uh, my background, I'll just go over this very quickly. So I was in China for 25 years. Um, I started multiple companies there. I actually started five companies. Three were successful, two failed. Most of my work was focusing on cultural training. Yeah, and I've already pretty much covered this. So now... I want to address the issue of personality and culture because this is where generally the greatest confusion arises. I've gone to many companies where when I try to pitch them about my training, they'll tell me, oh, well, we have people from lots of different cultures, but we don't have cultural problems. Well, I'll say, okay, well, listen, tell you what, just let me come in. I'll give you guys free of charge. A, a, a cultural survey to look at your company and see what the situation is. And sure enough, when I go and I ask their employees about cultural conflicts with other employees, most of them say they don't really have a lot of conflicts. But when I ask them about personality conflicts, make a list of the three or five people in your company that you have the biggest personality conflict with. They'll write it down, they'll say, okay, how many of those people are from a different cultural background than yours? And most, usually, most of them are. 
turns out it is not a personality conflict. It is a cultural conflict, but they've misidentified it as being a personality issue. And I'm gonna go into this in much more detail a little further on. So personality. Personality is a combination of environment and genetics. Part of our personality is certainly formed by our experiences, the, the environment we're in. Part of it is genetic. You have twins born with the same, same family, same environment, who have very, very different personalities. Um, personality is generally slow to change. It takes, you can change, but it's generally very slow. And it's an individual issue. You know, every person has their own individual personality. Culture is 100% learned behavior. There is nothing whatsoever genetic about culture. A Chinese person born and raised in Canada, in Canadian culture, will be Canadian. They're not going to act and think like a Chinese person. Okay? Culture is 100% learned behavior. Because of that, you can change culture more quickly than you can change personality. It's easier. So if you're looking at a personality versus a culture conflict, you want to hope it's a cultural conflict. You can change it more easily, more effectively. And it's much more of a societal issue. Again, culture is something we learn from the society around us. It's not as much of an individual issue. So one of the most common causes of cultural conflict is when a culture-based behavior is interpreted as a personality behavior. Now the thing here is, when we talk about personality, every culture in the world has the same personalities. Every culture in the world has people who are independent and dependent. Every culture in the world has people who are extrovert and introvert. Every culture in the world has people who are you know, creative or uncreative, whatever it is. Personalities are universal. Every culture has those personalities. But the way we demonstrate those personalities in different cultures is very, very different. I'll give you a simple example of this. In some cultures, if, you know, let's say in your company, in your work, someone who is a subordinate or equal position to you, either lower position or equal position to you, they feel you have done something wrong. You've made a mistake. In some cultures, they have two choices how to handle that. Number one, say nothing, just let it go. Or number two, talk to you about it directly. Option number three, go to your boss and tell your boss without talking to you. In some cultures, that type of behavior would be considered to be dishonest, disloyal, disrespectful. You went behind my back. You stabbed me in the back. You didn't give me the opportunity to try to change before you talked to my boss. You made me look bad in front of my boss without talking to me first, without giving me the opportunity to correct it. So in some cultures, that type of behavior would be very, very bad. And personality-wise, we would describe that person as dishonest, disloyal, unreliable, you know, things like that. However, there are other cultures where if you are a subordinate or equal position, you have no right to tell that person that they made a mistake or they were wrong. To do so is disrespectful. Only their superior, someone in a higher position, has the right to tell them that they made a mistake. For you to go, especially a subordinate, to go to you and tell you that you are wrong, you made a mistake, is incredibly disrespectful, is very, very bad. But to go to the boss, they tell the boss, if the boss disagrees, they accept the boss's decision. If the boss agrees, the boss can talk to you and tell you what you did wrong. The boss has that right, you don't. Now, I faced this when I was in China, 1993. I just graduated university, went off to China. I was teaching English in university. 
my first time ever teaching, my first full-time job, my first time in China, everything was brand new to me. I knew I was going to make mistakes. I knew I was going to have problems. So I was always asking my students, what can I do better? Is there anything I can change? Is there anything you don't like? How can I improve the class? How can I make it more interesting? And my students always responded, you're a great teacher. We love your class. It's great. Then we hit midterm. I had my first assessment with the dean of the English department. I went in all confident because my students love me. And the first thing he says to me, John, I talked to your students. They said they don't like this. 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 I was incredibly pissed off. My, I had actively asked my students. And they had disrespected me phenomenally by not even giving me the opportunity to change or improve. Instead, they lied to my face and told me I was a good teacher, then went to my boss and told him that I was a bad teacher. I was ready to quit. But first I went to some of my Chinese friends. And my friends explained to me, John, in China, for a student to criticize a teacher, for a student to tell a teacher that they're doing something wrong or they can do it better would be very, very disrespectful. They have no right to do that. Not talking to you, not telling you those things was a sign of their respect. If they had criticized you directly, that would be a sign of disrespect. That would mean they no longer respected you as a teacher. They have no right to tell you what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad. But your boss, the dean, he does. They went to him, and I'm sure some of the things they complained about, he disagreed with them. If he disagreed with them, they accepted that. That's fine. The things he agreed with them, he is my boss. He has more experience than me. He has the right to tell me what's, what, I should, what I've done wrong, how I should change. Now, that, those behaviors, I interpreted those in terms of personality. They're being disrespectful, dishonest, backstabbing. Because in my culture, that's how that behavior would be interpreted. That's what it would mean. But in that culture, it was actually not disrespectful. It was demonstrating respect. So this is a simple example of how the same personality traits, respect, can be demonstrated in completely different ways in different cultures. So it's very, the moment you're, if you're dealing with someone from another culture and you're assigning personality labels to them, that is a danger sign. First of all, start checking. It, sometimes it'll be personality. Every culture has people who are dishonest or people who are honest. Sometimes it's gonna be personality, but sometimes it's gonna be culture. And you need to, you need to be aware of that and looking at that. So now I want to make this practical. I don't want this to just be theoretical. I want you guys to have something that you can take home with you and be using. So we're going to talk about one of the cultural dialects. I told you, culture is a language with different dialects. So the, the dialects we're going to talk about here are doing cultures and being cultures. A doing culture, this is a culture, and by the way, I want to emphasize I did give you one example from my experience in China, but from now on, I am not going to be talking about any specific culture whatsoever. Okay, we're not gonna talk about Chinese cultures like this or you know, German cultures like this. We're just talking about the dialects. So doing culture and being culture. Doing culture is a culture in which your, your status, your position in society, your sense of self-worth, how other people see you, is determined by what you have done, by what you have accomplished. A being culture is the opposite. A being culture is a culture where all those things, your, your status, your place in society, your reputation, your sense of self-worth is based on all sorts of factors like you know, your family background. Is your family rich or poor? 
what type of university did you go to? A big, a, a, a famous one or a small, unimportant one? Uh, do you have a lot of money? Are you famous? What groups or organizations do you belong to? All these different factors. Your personal accomplishments are not that important. So I'm gonna give you an example to help you understand the difference. Let's say we have a company that has a position that's opened up for a promotion. We have two candidates being considered for promotion. The first candidate, he's the top performer in his department, does an excellent job, well-respected, very trustworthy. His family is a very poor family. Uh, his parents are not well, are, are, are not well educated. Uh, he didn't go to a very good university and his relationship with his boss, his boss doesn't hate him, but it's not a really close relationship either. Second guy is not a, ter not a terrible worker. He's not great either. He's pretty average, not exceptional in any way in terms of his performance, but his family is a high society family, well known. He went to a top university, Harvard or Yale or something like that, and he has a close relationship with his boss. In a doing culture, first guy gets the promotion, being culture, second guy gets the promotion. Another simple example, man and woman are in love with each other. They wanna get married. The man comes from, again, a very poor, uneducated family background. His parents are peasants, never, never finished high school, didn't have a lot of money. He worked his butt off, finished off of his class in high school, got into a good university, worked his butt off through university, finished off his class in university, spent several years working, now has started his own company, has been running the company for two years, and they're growing, they're doing fairly well. The woman comes from a very high society, successful, wealthy family that is very involved in business, owns several large businesses. Their parents are both well-educated, everything like that. In a doing culture, the parents will have a very positive perception of this guy. The fact that he comes from a poor background not only is not a negative, but could actually be a positive because he has overcome so much to become successful. Look at how much he has done. Look at what he has accomplished. This is someone who's a good match for our daughter. But in a being culture, doesn't matter how much he's accomplished. We're wealthy, high society. His parents are, are poor, very low society. We can't, there's no compatibility. They can't, we can't join these families together. Okay, so those would be examples of a doing and a being culture. Right now, so far it's been me talking to you guys. I don't think anybody learns by just listening. We learn by actually applying what we're learning. So that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna ask you guys just make groups of two or three people together. I'm gonna give you a few different questions, a few different things to talk about. So first of all, what are some of the negative ways that people from a being culture may view people from a doing culture? So if we have this person is being, this person is doing, what are some of the negative words the being person would use to describe the doing person? Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example. The being person may describe the doing person as being selfish. They only care about themselves. They, they don't care about the people around them. They focus on themselves and what they can do. Okay, that would be one example. So I'm gonna give you guys just one or two minutes, make some groups, talk together. What would be some negative terms that being would use to describe doing? Go ahead. <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> 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 
I'm interested in the in the workshop. It's only where that I didn't have a he couldn't believe that anybody had been busy with all these things. He wanted me to do some of the Senate. I actually went through it for a technical trainer and a person himself, actually. And yet he was so willing to be somebody who's never started a start from scratch. I don't know that I remember anything around the line. And almost looked at me as not really as a human as soon as he heard I did that. Even though I had all the square All right, I'm going to interrupt you because we have a lot to cover in a short time. So just anybody, what are your thoughts? How is being going to describe doing? Okay, so selfish or egocentric, certainly, too, too, too focused on themselves. Anything else? Well, um, again, that would be a high status being person may consider a low status being person to be unqualified. But if you had two high status, high status doing and a high status being, that wouldn't necessarily be a factor. But there would be other things in how they perceive each other. Yes? I guess it would be like what all of us take as why why you came up with this stuff of being being open to the past so much that you hope you can be able to do it that great. Um yeah, absolutely. Uh being cultures tend to be much more of a group thing. You know, doing cultures tend to be more of an individual's thing. So the being culture may be more likely to like this is how we've always done it. Whereas the doing culture is more well we could try this, we could do this. There's something different we could use. They're a, they're a troublemaker. My uh, mother was from a BA culture, and she would describe my girlfriends who were from doing cultures mm. as they're not nice people. Yep. Her word was nice. Yeah. And that meant class. That's right. It was a euphemism for class. Yeah, exactly. The, again, yeah, those, those class distinctions, very, very important. Yeah. They're, they're, they're one of the foundational things. So, and, and you know, again, like respectful or disrespectful, uh, particularly you know, more egalitarian societies where people with lower status treat people with higher status essentially the same. In a being culture, that would be considered very, very disrespectful. Yeah. I've heard of cases where Middle Eastern men have come with their wives. And they have been met with handshakes, whereupon the Middle Eastern man has mm. has uh, uh, struck the yeah. welcomer because the welcomer was a doer, and he's from a being culture mm. where you don't do that. I think that would that would be more of a a cultural behavior. It wouldn't necessarily be a, a doing and being thing. But yes, there, there are many different things like that you need to be aware of as well. A another good example is just in the Middle East. This means this you know so you, know, you have to be very careful in in many of your of your gestures all right so let's, let's move on now the other way what are the negative perceptions that doing are going to have of being people so again you can talk together in your groups just give you one or two minutes how will be, be doing people describe being people Yeah. 
Okay. All right. So let me hear what are your ideas? What will doing think of being? Entitled, snobbish. Yep, that's right. Entitled, snobbish. In fact, you know, in, in North America right now, we have the, the whole thing about people being privileged. Now, we are a doing culture. Being privileged is considered a negative thing. And a being culture, privilege would be considered a normal good thing. Of course, I should have more advantages. I should have a higher position because I come from this family background. I have these associations. Okay, what other, what other things how doing will perceive being? It's seen as uh, outdated. Okay, why? Okay, there I think I wouldn't quite agree, at least with, with what you've said, the last part there. Um, doing cultures and being cultures, for example, will both have entrepreneurs. Um, you know, but the difference is a doing culture, the entrepreneur is going to be respected for his personal accomplishments. A being culture, that entrepreneur is, if he, if he comes from high society already, he's going to be pretty much automatically respected. Whereas if he comes from low society, low position, he's going to have to work much longer and harder to get to a position where he'd have some level of respect from other people. Anything else? Okay, now, one thing I want to point out here, another, another thing, doing will also describe being as being disrespectful. And this is something which is very important to understand that in cultural differences, very often the same negative terms that we're using to describe them, they're also using to describe us. Disrespectful because respect in a doing and being culture are demonstrated in a completely different way. So if a being person sees a doing person, they consider them disrespectful because they're not showing disrespect in the way that being people do. But the doing person looking at the being person also considers them disrespectful because they're not showing respect in the way that the doing person would expect. So very often the negative terms that we're thinking that we're using to describe them, very often they're using exactly the same terms to describe us. Now, all these things we've just talked about in diversity, diversity and inclusion, one of the big things that we talk about is unconscious bias. Just biases that we have that we don't even think about. All these things we've just identified, all these things we've talked about, about how being will think of doing and how doing will think of being, these are your unconscious biases. You will automatically interpret other people's behaviors in terms of your cultural context. And you need to be aware of that bias, recognizing when it's happening and be, being ready to ask questions to identify, is this really a personality issue or is it a cultural issue? Okay, now next, and we're gonna go through this fairly quickly, but what are some differences between how doing and culture, being cultures, will show different emotions? Uh, love for children, anger at employee. And again, I'll give you an example of this one, uh, love for children. Uh, in a doing culture, parents who love their children will generally push their children to be independent. When they're 18 years old, they're out of the house. They're living on their own. Uh, 
the hobbies that they want, the, the things that they want to get involved in are their choice. In a being culture, parents who love their children will generally uh, try, try to keep their children at home. They don't want their children to move away. They will tend to make a lot more decisions for their children. You know, you should do this, you should do this. Both cultures, the parents absolutely love their children, but they demonstrate that love in completely different ways. Right? So I just like you, you can use, you can use love for children. If you can think of other examples, uh, being angry, if you're angry at an employee, what are the difference between how doing and being culture? If you have a disagreement with someone, just think of a scenario, generally a, a scenario of, of conflict or something like that. What would the difference be in how a doing culture and a being culture would address that situation? Again, two or three minutes, you can talk together. All right. Okay. Let me interrupt you. I'm listening. We got some good conversations going this time. So tell me, what are some differences in how doing and being cultures will handle different emotions? Okay. All right. Anyone else? Okay, let me ask you. Um, an employee has been criticized by their boss. They, they made a big mistake. They did something wrong. Their boss is angry at them. What is the difference between how a doing and a being person will approach their boss? What will the doing person do? Okay, let's say he acknowledges he did make a mistake. There's no doubt about that. So he's not trying to justify himself. Yes, he made a mistake. He did something wrong. His boss is angry. What should he do? Okay, take responsibility, take action, fix the problem. What about being? How will a being person respond to this? Okay, remember, being... Being culture is about relationship. So the being employee, their focus is much more on the fact that their relationship with their boss has been damaged. So what are they going to do? 
How? Gifts. Yeah, that's right. In a being culture, they're much more likely, their boss is angry at them. They buy a gift for their boss, take their boss to dinner, um, try to, you know, try to flatter their boss, say nice things about their boss. Their first, their first focus is on getting the boss to like them, to fix that relationship, then to take care of the task. So doing culture, focus on the task, being culture, focus on the relationship. Okay, um, how much time do I have left? Okay, all right. Okay, we'll, we'll go to this because this is the meat. And then after this, I'll share some stories with you to help illustrate this. But this is the meat. Okay, this is where you are on the street or you're in your office. You meet someone for the first time. They are from a culture that you know nothing about. You do not know if this person is a doing culture or a being culture. What cues, what signals can you be looking for to help you figure out, is this person doing or being? So, for example, in their language, doing culture and being culture. One way, doing culture is going to say, I, me, my, more often. Being culture is going to say us, we, our, more often. So that would be one thing you can be looking for. Are they using I, me, my, or us, we, our? Just, no, we don't have to have discussion, but just anybody else, can you think of other language cues? Okay, uh, so how do they treat them? What's the... Well, a doing culture would be pretty equal. Yeah. A being culture would be very, uh, you're way down there. And, and okay, yeah, that, that, would be, that would certainly be a, a possibility. Same. Yeah. Uh, when, when, I, when I went to China, one of the things that shocked me was it like in a Chinese restaurant. I'm Canadian. I say thank you for everything. When I went to restaurants in China and I said thank you to the staff, my Chinese friends were all shocked. Why are you saying thank you to them? You just, you don't do that. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Okay, another one would be, some would ask questions, some managers or employers would ask questions or others would bark at their employees. So, I think one of them would be, like there are some that do from, especially the ones, the companies that are not unionized mm. would, have a mix of both asking and some would have a bit of barking. Okay, what do you mean by barking? Like, as in, like, you know, barking as in, you know, when you're speaking with yeah. people, like you're yelling. Like, that's what okay. I mean. Okay. So you, you think uh, being will yell more and doing will not? Is that, or doing will yell more? Which one is yelling? I is, think uh, yelling would be, the barking yelling would be more of the, but which one, doing or being? I think uh, doing, doing, being. Okay, now, um, right, now that, that's a good idea. That's actually an example of cultural bias, uh, kind of, an, in, uh, actually the truth is both doing and being cultures will have some bosses that are shouting and barking all the time, yeah other people who aren't. So that wouldn't really be a doing or being issue. That would be, that would be another, another issue. Well, would that, like, well, that, that would be really much more of a, a leadership style or personality issue. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, uh, maybe the, uh, the boss will look, will care for the family, employee's family. How will their family grow if not being culture? Okay, um, no, there you're actually talking about two different things. You're talking about language and behavior. Uh, so with language, yes, a, when you meet somebody for the first time, a doing person is going to ask you more questions about what you've done. You know, um, where do you work? You know, what is your position? What do you do? Things like that. 
a being culture is more likely to ask you questions about your family. You know, what is your family? Because, you know, uh, what, what, what organizations do you belong to? Another language example would be ask, some, and a lot of this you can elicit the responses by asking the right questions. Ask them about their education. Doing person will say, I studied business. They will identify what their major was. They may identify their university as well, but that'll be secondary. So I studied business at Harvard. A being culture is going to identify the university first. I went to Harvard because the organization, the fame of that name is more important than what they did individually. Okay, so there are a lot of things like this in the language that they use. And you can ask questions, like ask them, ask them about their family. If they smile and enjoy talking about their family, they're probably more on the being side. If they react, you know, rather conservatively, obviously you're not very comfortable talking about it, probably more on the doing side. Okay, why? That's right. No, and okay, you're right. It doesn't mean you don't care about them. But this is the first time we have met each other. Okay, I don't know you. If I'm from a doing culture, odds are that is too personal a question. I'm uncomfortable talking about that with someone I don't know. Okay. Whereas with a being person, I'll feel much more comfortable to do that. Yeah. yeah. What about somebody that um, you can't read his mind? Like you don't put any expression. Like you can't tell. Like you can't read the person's mind. If... Right. But th that's a game where asking questions to elicit their behavior. This isn't just emotional reaction. Like you know, again, if you ask them questions and they're saying me, me. I mean my, they talk about what they have done, things like that, they're probably more doing. If they're, you know, so a large part of this is actively eliciting responses from them and then be, knowing how to interpret that. I'm gonna move on quickly, okay? Uh, behaviors, um, and I think because we're almost out of time, I will just cover this one very quickly. Uh, behaviors towards others. So uh, doing culture, their behavior to other, towards other people is their going, respect is based on what you have accomplished, okay? If you have accomplished a lot, you've done a lot, you have their respect. Being culture, respect is going to be based on your family background, your, the organizations you belong to, your position in society, things like that. So like you were saying in the restaurant, the way that they treat, you know, doing culture in a restaurant is likely going to treat the, the staff, you know, equitably, whereas being culture is going to see them as, as lower status and perhaps treat them badly, okay? Um, and reactions, so how, how people react. And again, this would be one like, you know, ask them about their family, see what their reaction is. Um, <clears throat> You know, when you're talking about yourself, um, if you're a doing person and you're talking more about the things that you have done, if they're asking you questions more about, well, you know, where did you go to school or what organizations do you belong to, things like that, what is their reaction? Are they reacting positively or negatively to this? So I want to wrap up here, but the important thing from this that I want you guys to take away is with this information, you can meet anybody anywhere from any culture. And without knowing anything about that culture, without having any training, no knowledge of it whatsoever, by knowing what cues to look for, by knowing how to elicit the types of reactions that you want, you can start to put together, and this isn't gonna happen in one or two minutes, it takes a bit of time, but you can start to put together a cultural profile for this person if they are more doing or more being. And then you can adapt your own behaviors, your own expectations accordingly. Okay, we're gonna skip that. All right, so this is just a brief overview. This is one category, one dialect, doing and being. There are, there are 20 
different categories, 20 different dialects that you can learn about. So once you've got all of those, you've got a massive toolkit to be able to meet people and evaluate what their cultural orientations are and how you should react to them. Uh, there are two different options for two different ways you can learn about this. One, for companies, I do do company training, uh, but I think most people here today probably aren't in a position for, for that. The other thing, this isn't ready yet, but within, within the next six months, I'm also going to be setting up an online, online course about these things that people can just sign up for individually. So if an individual has an, has an interest in that. So if you would be interested in either of those, uh, please talk to me. And if you're interested in the online course, send me an email or a message or something like that and i will or just look check out my website occasionally and i'll make an announcement when the online course is ready finally um, this is our assessment tool okay this is something i have developed myself tested over many many years this is basically a simple questionnaire that you can do Answer, answer a bunch of questions, send it to me. I will generate this graph. So here, for example, here we have being versus doing. If this is over here, that means that you are very strong being. If it's over here, it means you're strong doing. Here, this person is kind of in the middle. So it means they're, they're, they're in the middle between the two. This is a spectrum, okay? It's not just you are doing or you are being. There's a spectrum. Okay, so we have a bunch of different categories here. Uh, this, this is one of the main tools that I use when I'm doing the training. So first of all, you can look at your own results and get a better insight as to where you are. And second, if you're doing this with someone else, for example, the two of you, you could use this to identify exactly what, the, what categories you have the biggest conflicts in, the biggest differences. And that can be used to help guide you as to what areas you're most likely to have conflicts, what strategies you can use to avoid those conflicts. So contact info, if you're interested in my training programs, uh, inquiries about partnerships. If, you, if you're someone who does training, consulting, anything like that, you'd like to partner with me, please contact me. Uh, info about conferences or other speaking opportunities. I'm always looking for opportunities to speak and let people know about this. And referrals to potential clients, if you know anybody that would be interested in me. Website, languageofculture.net. Email jlombard at languageofculture.net and my LinkedIn is there. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much. If you have any more questions, please come and talk to me. So now we'll go over here and be quick once. And thank you, Envision, you make for making this recording possible.